All right. Uh, I'm Chris Linus from NASA, and I'd like to welcome everybody to another in our set of uh, WIGIS tech webinars. Um, as usual, we try to find a common theme, um, but then, you know, bring in some fairly diverse examples, both from around the world as well as from different aspects of the, um, of the community. Um, and so in this case, the, at first glance, the common theme is simply Python. You know, all three of these talks will be talking about the use of Python, particularly in the aid of um, science analysis. Uh, but there's actually another theme that, uh, that might start to appear in part of this as well, which is the, uh, the use of fairly powerful back-end services, which are then fronted by some sort of Python, and at least in many cases by uh, an interactive Jupyter Notebook version of that Python, which allows us to provide both the power of analysis to the end user while at the same time giving them a kind of an interactive way of working with that. Uh, making for a much more powerful user experience. Um, so the first talk is going to be by Siad, Syed Rizvi on the Open Data Cube. He's going to talk about the recently developed Open Data Cube Jupyter Notebooks for water distribution, uh, wa rather water classification application. Um, and he's been working, I, I think, with Brian Kilo in the COS SEO on some of this work. Um, so Syed, uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Syed Rizvi, and I'm the project lead of the CIOS Open Data Cube Initiative here at AMA in Hampton, Virginia. I work very closely with uh, Brian Kilo of NASA Langley. Uh, here I had a team of uh, uh, some six uh, to eight talented software developers and uh, solution architects who work with the satellite imagery and the development of various aspects of the Open Data Cube framework. So the talk today uh, is very short. Um, the main focus is, of course, um, Python and Juniper Notebooks. Um, I'll briefly talk about what the Data Cube is, uh, why we use Python, um, what are the modules and libraries that we, we have used, um, and finally I'll demo some of the notebooks that we have recently developed. So as we all know, satellite imagery illustrates uh, a dense representation of data on a uniform grid. Um, CIOS has started the Open Data Cube Initiative. Um, in short, we call it ODC to provide an open source data architecture solution uh, that has value to its uh, global users and increases the impact of Earth observation satellite data. The ODC is a common anal analytical framework that includes API development, cloud integration, so we use Amazon Cloud Service, a web-based user interface that we have developed in the last one year. And data analytics facilitates the organization and analysis of large gridded data collections. Now, based on uh, analysis-ready data um, from current CR satellite systems, uh, we usually fetch it, fetch it from USGS. Uh, the ODC is a technological solution that removes the burden of data preparation. Um, so you don't have to, usually we have seen that data preparation takes 90% of the time. Um, by the scientists, and 10% is when they do the analysis. Um, we have made all the efforts to take away that burden, so ultimately yielding rapid results and utilizing an international global community for contributions. Um, the ODC is currently um, operating in um, Australia, Colombia, and Switzerland. Uh, with several more, more countries in uh, development. Uh, we have been contacted by um, other countries, Vietnam, um, Thailand, Kenya, um, UK, uh, Canada. Um, my short presentation here will provide a hands-on introduction to the Open Data Cube, including the topics of uh, data processing, data interoperability, 
um, application analysis um, with the focus of Python uh, as a programming language with Juniper Notebook. Here is a, a very high level representation of how things work. Uh, you can see there is a file system at the very bottom of this uh, layered architecture. Uh, this file system uh, can be a um, S3 Amazon um, cloud storage. It can be a data cube storage. Um, it can be any kind of storage depending on um, the user's need. We ingest the data and while ingesting the data we do a reprojection if needed. Uh, we change the resolution if that is needed, uh, provide um, these services and do indexing. After the data is indexed, it is stacked, it is aligned um, and it's ready for the retrieval which can have a reprojection not necessary, but then it's ready for the analysis. Now the main thing I want to talk about here is um, the Python programming language that has many advantages as a tool for scientific computing, um, remote sensing, and machine learning. Um, in fact, Python is one of the most popular programming languages for research in these fields, um, even though it was not created with these applications in mind. Uh, the major advantage that make Python a great fit for ODC, uh, Open Data Cube project here, and remote sensing um, in general, are its uh, extensive standard library and selection of add-on packages, uh, its readability, its ease of programming compared to other um, programming languages, and the great quantity of help resources um, easily found online. So every time I talk to somebody, you know, they say, yeah, there's a lot of help that is available. Um, the foremost feature of Python that makes it a good choice for uh, scientific computing, especially in, in our environment here at, for ODC, is its uh, vast uh, standard library and selection of add-on packages, as I mentioned. Uh, Python makes it easy to import powerful modules to be used for scientific computing, um, some of which I will talk about, and uh, one, of it, one of them I will, I will, I will also demo. Um, the use, uh, one, one thing I want to mention here is that the use of standard library also solves one of the Python's major drawbacks. Now, this major drawback to Python is its slowness. Um, Python is slower than other lower la level languages such as C because Python is uh, interpreted and uh, is dynamically typed, meaning that programs uh, written in Python must perform more operations at execution time. Now this slow uh, method of executing code comes with the benefit of more versatile, easy to code language and the use of imported modules um, that can mitigate the slowness. Um, the standard library allows developers to use modules um, which implement uh, Python code in C um, and thus uh, greatly increase the time at which Python code can run. Now, um, we definitely are clear why we are using Python. Um, what I want to mention is that um, we, in the last one year, have heavily used uh, these four libraries, um, modules, uh, NumPy, SciPy, uh, Scikit-Learn for machine learning, and uh, Matplotlib for visualization. Some of these I will uh, just briefly talk about. Uh, NumPy is a module um, which allows developers to store data in large multi-dimensional arrays as well as to perform complex operations on the data in these arrays efficiently. And that is something I will demo today. Um, this module is implemented basically in C, allowing operations on arrays to be carried out quickly. Um, even when the arrays contain a massive number of data points. Uh, using NumPy and working with remote sensing data allows for different bands of information to be stored in arrays where a developer can efficiently perform statistical analysis and operation. 
The second one here is the SciPy, which is a third-party library, again, containing modules used for linear, linear algebra, uh, optimization, image processing, and other tasks relating to scientific computing. Now, SciPy is useful for ODC, or in general, remote sensing, in that the scientific computing perform uh, functions it, uh, it contains can also be run on um, remote sensing data loaded into uh, NumPy arrays. Um, using SciPy in conjunction with the NumPy arrays makes performing um, complicated mathematical processes on millions of uh, data points, that is uh, usually our case, uh, as simple as calling a function. And that's something, that's something I'll show. Uh, we just call um, a function from an imported library, and um, it, it's extremely easy for, for even a new person to, to use. Uh, the third one is scikit-learn. And that is something we have started using this summer. It's, again, a third-party library, which gives Python developers access to a variety of machine learning algorithms, including support vector machines, uh, k-means clustering, um, and, and so many others. Um, Scikit library builds upon NumPy and SciPy. So it builds upon the previous two, meaning functions found in SciPy and uh, Scikit-learn can all be run on data in the same way NumPy array um, without having to change the format. The machine learning functions containing in SciPy uh, learn kit have uh, lots and lots of use in, in our domain. Um, and it has been very useful for um, some of the machine learning algorithms that we work where we wanted to figure out uh, what is water and what is not water in Sentinel-1 uh, when we already knew uh, what is water and what is not, not water in Landsat. The last one, matplotlib, that is uh, one of the libraries we started using um, from the beginning, uh, three, four years back, um, in the DataCube project. Is Again, it allows developers access to an interface similar to the programming uh, language uh, in MATLAB. Uh, this library includes modules for creating huge variety of charts and, uh, and graphs, which can be useful in the field of uh, any scientific computing, I would say. Uh, Matplotlib also has great ut utility when working with the um, uh, remote sensing data. Um, that is something I have seen um, in other projects uh, because it gives developers the ability to generate uh, visual representation of uh, data, and the data can be big data also, um, can be actually large amount, volume of data. Uh, for example, a Land classification of uh, land set seen can be represented by a plot with x and y axis um, um, equal to uh, latitude and longitude extents of the scene uh, with land water cloud extra plotted and uh, color coded. The Juniper notebooks, Jupyter notebooks that I will be demoing today, I'll just uh, briefly go over. Um, why we have picked uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, one of the useful features um, that actually uh, Python provides is the ability to code using these notebooks. Um, they were previously known as IPython Notebooks. Um, these notebooks allow developers to parse their code into blocks, which can be run independently of each other with variables stored in the background. So uh, dividing the code up in this way can save lots and lots of time. And that has been the case that we have seen. And it allows the developers specifically, you know, uh, if you are performing any extreme programming or pair programming where th there are two people working together and then separately and then again together, um, they can test their code um, a few lines at a time uh, without running other lengthy processes. So with that, I will go to the, the demos.
and I have uh, shared my screen. I just want to make sure that everybody can see. I think so. So this is the first notebook um, from a series of uh, four notebooks that I'm um, going to show you here. The purpose of this notebook is, uh, as you can see, it's a water supply monitoring of Lake Chad. Uh, I'll just go over a case study that we have recently done on Lake Chad. Now, Lake Chad is a large shallow lake bordered by African countries of Cameroon, Chad, Niger, and Nigeria. The surrounding region depends on Lake Chad as a primary source of fresh water and irrigation. And now this notebook will focus on monitoring the water supply in the Lake Chad region before and after the rainy season, and specifically for 2015. Now, as you can see here, we have uh, a region, uh, a small part of Lake Chad. Uh, Lake Chad is the focus here because Lake Chad is shrinking. Um, and to give you a historical perspective here, you can see this from 1963 all the way to 2016. Over the last 40 years, Lake Chad has decreased by more than 90% in surface area uh, from 26,000 square kilometers to now only uh, 1,500 square kilometers. Uh, the shrinkage has been a particularly popular case study um, because of the decline. Uh, it's very large. The decline is, is very large, so it's very easy to monitor and observe it. Uh, also, weather and flooding patterns are predictable. Uh, the decline endangered many communities in the area. Um, so we, I'm going to demo how we perform this case study using the ODC framework. Um, the analysis here basically is uh, looking for four things. Um, one of this is uh, when does the rainy season start and when does the rainy season end? That's part of this analysis. The second is um, what is water and what is not water um, in that area. The third is to measure how much water is there. And the fourth is basically to compare um, how much water the region had before rain, uh, rainy season and how much water was there. Um, after the rainy season. So I'm, this was just one notebook, which was just an introduction to what um, we are trying to do. Um, this is the second notebook, um, which is basically titled Analyzing Rainfall Near Lake Chad. And what we want to do is, um, in this notebook, we want to focus on uh, solving the problem of finding whether the rainy season, when the rainy season starts. So it's, it's finding out um, what's the time when the monsoon comes and ends, or Lake Chad. Um, there are other notebooks that I'll demo quickly. Um, and they deal with analyzing the Lake Chad region before and after the rainy season. Um, to determine how much rainy water, how much rain did this um, contribute to. Um, the algorithmic process that we will go through is um, create a data cube object. We'll create the data cube object first, uh, define the boundaries, use those boundaries to load the data, and then uh, we'll create a time series representation of data and perform curve fitting um, to find out when does the rainy season start and end. So you can see we have loaded the data here. And uh, there's a lot of um, explanation going on in this notebook, uh, which makes it very popular in the user community, uh, because they can just understand what is going on with the code. Um, here we have the, the region. We are setting the boundaries here uh, with the Latlon as well as the time range. 
again, the explanation along with the images is very easy with the Python notebook. Um, and we are explaining um, what is this data. This data is the GPM data, global precipitation data, which has liquid precipitation, total precipitation. Um, another component is a percentage liquid and, and ice precipitation. And just by performing the print statement, we can see and explore the data. And here, basically, it's giving the coordinates, dimensions, data variables, and data size. And then we are computing the mean, mean of the um, precipitation. So after computing the mean of precipitation, we find the total precipitation part of it. So you can see we have times and we have values. And then we simply use the matplotlib uh, function uh, plot to plot how the, the rain has occurred. We have the x-axis as time and y-axis as the total precipitation. And then we basically perform a curve fitting. And you can see um, just by importing the curve fit Gaussian, uh, we have in one line basically we have performed the curve fitting, that is the red one, and then uh, just by trial and error, uh, we used uh, two standard deviation and found when the rainy season started, it's, uh, starting of June, and when has the rainy season ended, that is uh, somewhere in October. And that is how we found out what is pre-rainy season and what is uh, post-rainy season. With this one, I would like to show the actual code, the Python code, is only this much. Um, but the notebook goes on into explanation, illustration, um, giving more thought. You can ask questions there. It makes it very interesting for the users to, um, to go through. Then we have um, the third notebook, which is uh, taking the pre-monsoon and post-monsoon um, imagery, creating a composite, basically creating a mosaic, which is cloud-free and gap-free. And uh, here we will end up having um, several, we will have several steps. Um, we'll take the data, we will uh, filter clouds and scan lines, we'll create a mosaic, and we'll have a cloud-free mosaic that is pre-monsoon and post-monsoon. We follow the same steps. We create a data cube object. We define the boundaries um, for the, this data. And remember, this data is Landsat 7. Uh, GPM, GPM data we already have analyzed. And then we start um, exploring the Landsat 7 data set that we have. Um, just with the print statement, you can see um, what all is going on here. This is just an illustration of the different bands that we have. Um, this all is uh, represented in a X-ray, uh, which is a three-dimensional uh, data array. Um, this is all housing uh, red, green, blue, uh, near infrared, and um, other bands. In this case, we are using red, green, blue, near infrared um, um, band for short wave infrared. Um, one and two. Um, this is just an example of showing the, the red band here. And if you go further, we want to perform cleanup on the scan line correction as well as the clouds. Now, these are provided by USGS as uh, separate bands. Um, in CFMAP previously, now it's uh, encoded in uh, bits. We perform the, the, the analysis using those bits. And I'll straight away go to the mosaic part and perform the median pixel uh, mosaic. Now, median pixel mosaic takes the median pixel um, from your um, time stack and gives you the clear pixel. Um, for each of the pixels in your Im image. And here we have pre-rainy season 
one mosaic available and then we have another post training season mosaic available. Um, the code is this much here. You can see it probably in, in, in one screen. But then you have so much explanation that it makes it so easy for a new user um, to understand what's going on in the behind the scenes. This is the final notebook uh, where we are performing water classification analysis of uh, Lake Chad. And uh, the previous uh, notebook introduced Landsat 7 imagery. Um, Lake Chad data set was split into pre and post rainy season data sets. The data sets were then cleaned in the previous uh, example to produce a cloud free and gap free uh, composite. Now this notebook will focus on analyzing bodies of water uh, using the results of uh, a water classification algorithm called WOOF. Uh, what we would be doing here is uh, loading the, the, the files, uh, introducing the uh, WOOF's water classification, um, uh, building in the plotting utilities using x-rays, then we'll perform the band arithmetic and we'll find out how the results look. So if you see, we will load the composites that we have already created in the last example. So we have pre-rainy season, post-rainy season, and then we perform the, the water classification. The water classification that we use uh, was a classifier that was developed by Australian government um, to study the, the, the flooding in 2011. It uses a regression tree, a machine learning model trained on um, several geographical um, terrains. And it has proven to be 98% correct um, as per um, the test cases that we have ran. So running the WOOPS classifier is extremely simple. We just uh, import the WOOPS classifier and then um, call the function with the pre-water and post-water, a pre-rainy season or post-rainy season mosaic. And it tells what is water and what is not water. So uh, zero for not water and one for water. And you can see for the pre-monsoon, we get this as um, the percentage of the times when a pixel was water. So if it's water all the time, it's, it's dark blue. And if it is, let's say, 50% of the time, it will be in between. And if it's never water, it will be, it will be white. And same thing we perform to the post rain water classification. And then the next step is basically performing a diff, which is a, you just do a minus on the, on the pixels. If the result is plus one, it means that the water has, uh, has gained there. If it is negative one, it means that water is lost. And zero means no change. This is a very simple uh, way of doing it. There, there can be other sophisticated ways of looking at the differences. And this is what we find out, that um, wh whichever pixels come up as red, that, that is the water has gained. And whichever pixels that are blue, uh, we have lost water. In this case, uh, we find very interesting um, result where we see one part of the Lake Chad where after the rainy season, the water has gained. And that is something we have reported to the, to the um, people doing the study on the Lake Chad. And they are currently looking into uh, why this has happened. Uh, this may be happening due to several reasons. Um, that is something that we have illustrated in our uh, case study. Um, plotting in general is, is extremely simple with the matplotlib. Um, this notebook, along with other notebooks related to urbanization, related to uh, flood detection, um, uh, there are others related to um, of, uh, coastal change. These are all available on the GitHub. If you go to opendatacube.org, 
Um, you'll find all kinds of information along with how to install um, DataCube framework, um, how to ingest data, how to perform analysis. Um, you will find um, examples of UIs, um, and especially the J Jupyter Notebooks have been very popular in the community. So that's my um, presentation. Um, I'll be here for any questions that you have. So thank you very much, Saya. That was very interesting. Um, I think we'll go on to our next uh, two talks and then uh, go for questions at the end to make sure everybody's got a chance to get a chance to talk. Uh, and so the next talk is going to be by Rich Fignell, um, who's going to be talking about uh, using Jupyter Notebooks in the um, IUs. The integrated ocean, integrated ocean observing system, um, also for doing some uh, classification uh, tasks, and again uh, using Jupyter notebooks as part of that process to knit the workflows together, if you will. Rich. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. All right. And the screen looks okay. Looks great. Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about a project we've done in the Integrated Ocean Observing System to automate skill assessment with Python. I'm doing this work with Philippe Fernandez and Kyle Wilcox, who are both funded to a large degree by IUSE. And uh, actually, and, uh, Philippe is also a core contributor to the Folium Python package, which you just saw in the previous presentation for doing interactive mapping in the notebook. So I'm going to be talking about basically trying to come up with a framework where we can work with models that have triangular grids like this and may have one vertical coordinate system with other models like this that have, uh, or sorry, a triangle-based coordinate system with other models like this that have a curvilinear coordinate system and maybe a different vertical coordinate and try to get away from building sort of standalone um, skill assessment tools like you see here in the middle. This was put together to look at water levels from a particular type of model and what we're really shooting for here is a framework that we can use in general with all sorts of models. And the reason for doing this is that the integration, Integrated Ocean Observing System, or IUS, is made up of 17 different federal agencies, 11 different regional associations. And in each one of these regions, there's a bunch of different models running, some from NOAA, some from uh, academic institutions. And, and there's a bunch of observations also being made by or, uh, organizations from um, the government down to uh, even the commercial sector. So the job of IUS is to try to integrate all these observations and modeling somehow. And so um, basically they, what they've done is said, if you want to be a player in IUS, if you want to be a data provider, you must provide your data in a web service. And for in situ data, like buoys, uh, sensors, trajectories, things moving through the water, they're, they're, they specify the o o OGC sensor observation service which is encoded in XML or CSV. And for gridded data, so for model output or satellites, uh, et cetera, bathymetry, they require you to deliver the data with OpenDAP with climate and forecast conventions. And that gets um, you know, delivered in a binary uh, DAP payload. So the way, we, um, the way that the providers actually provide this <laughs> is usually to run a threads data server, which is uh, from Unidata. It's everything inside this uh, black box here. And what it does is basically provide a way for, for providers to just throw a bunch of NetCDF or HDF or GRIB files in a, in a directory, and then via some markup language, aggregate and uh, those, data into, those data into a single logical data set in a virtual way and to virtually add uh, metadata content or change metadata content so that it becomes standardized, standardized with respect to this common data model in which we can represent sort of regular grids, staggered grids, these unstructured grids, the triangle-based grids, and a variety of different sort of, sort of types of sensors from time series, profiles, trajectories, et cetera. So once they've been standardized, they can be delivered through these different web services. As I mentioned, OpenDAP and SOS are the two primary ones for model output and for observational data. And also, the endpoints can be captured in NC-ISO. So there's an NC-ISO service which outputs uh, ISO files. So you have ISO metadata that contains the endpoints to these services. 
So from there, you can access the services through a variety of different libraries and clients. And I'm going to talk about um, the Python side today. Oh, and incidentally, uh, these things are pretty easy to get going yourself, um, particularly now that um, you can just install things with Docker. So you can just Docker install um, th threads if you're interested in being a data provider in this way. So we have a catalog. So we, every, all the providers, they created that ISO metadata. We scoop up all the ISO metadata on a regular basis and read it into uh, a catalog system that's uh, based on CCAN. So this may look familiar if you've been to data.gov or data.gov.uk. And what it allows you to do is look at all the data sets that you have, and you can see which services uh, are enabled here for each of the data sets. So this one has opened app web coverage service and SOS. This one also has WMS, but no SOS, so on. And you know, through this interface, if you're uh, just a user with a browser, you can zoom in on a particular location and select the particular service types and maybe some variables and maybe an organization or whatever, and do these kinds of searches and to narrow down your, your, uh, the data sets. But, um, but we're more interested in sort of the machine-to-machine -machine side because we want to automate this sort of um, retrieval of certain types of records. So we really focus on the uh, catalog service for the web, CSW service, that's provided by CSW. So we have a catalog that runs, the graphical part runs on CCAN, and there's a CSW part that runs with PyCSW, a Python package that's also installable by Docker, by the way. And so, you know, so then if you're in a client, and you want to access these CF compliant uh, model output, you can use the IRIS package that was built by the British Met Office. And so it allows you to work with these different coordinate systems, different uh, grid systems in the vertical and horizontal to do things like this, where we're comparing a curvilinear grid uh, model with a uh, regular grid model with a different vertical coordinate. This one's from um, the USGS. This one's from uh, NCEP. And we can use the exact same commands up here in the notebook to uh, extract data. So we don't need to know what the variables are called that held latitude and longitude or what the vertical coordinate system. That's all handled for you by IRIS because of the CF conventions. So now I'm going to actually jump to a notebook that sort of puts this all together, from the, that does a catalog search, accesses data from endpoints, um, does some analysis and some skill assessment, and then creates some plots in the end. We originally did this notebook for the Boston Light Swim uh, and the people who were actually swimming in this eight-mile race without a wetsuit from this point here into Boston Harbor wanted to know um, how reliable the models were because there was a forecast water temperature that was quite cold from one of the models. And they contacted us and they said, well, you know, how well can we trust these models? And so we thought we would just deploy this notebook to find out how the models looked uh, relative to data. So now I'm going to actually jump to the notebook itself. And um, I'm going to turn off my mail. Um, OK, so let's see. Maybe I'll increase the size a little bit. OK, so you know I'm actually going to take this notebook that was developed for Boston, and I'm going to modify it, because the whole point of this is that you can grab these and do something else with them. So this one, which you, if you want to run the light swim, you can just Google on um, Boston Light Swim and GitHub, and you'll find our, um, actually, I guess it's right here, you'll find our data demo center, where there's a bunch of different um, pieces of code that you can look at. And this one's here. And if you scroll to the end, you can, um, you can fire this up on Binder, um, which will launch this on the cloud with the proper environment, so that you don't even actually have to install anything. OK, so but back to the notebook that I'm running locally here. Just at the top, the user creates, um, types in a start and a stop time. Here we've done minus five days and plus four days. So it'll just find anything that's um, within the last five days or, or forecast up to four days out. And here we just specify this bounding box. And, um, and here we've, uh, whoops, well, hold on a second. This is the one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one on binder. Hold on a second. Uh, this is the one I wanted to show you, um, where I've changed the bounding box here to New York Harbor. Um, and I've specified a CRS here, because th that specifies that I want to specify these in longitude latitude order, not latitude longitude. And um, I'm going to look for seawater temperature. And these are the different CF names 
that are used um, in IUS. We don't need semantics because we know exactly what the names. Uh, we have a common vocabulary for our data, which is nice. And we're going to look at these two. We're going to say everything. Uh, if there's anything that's not Celsius, we're going to convert it to Celsius. And we're going to search these two catalogs. Now, um, you know, this could be data.gov. We could add that in here as well. I just wanted to, you know, this is going to be the main catalog, the IUS catalog. But this is a local catalog that I'm running here. Uh, where I can enter other data sets into this uh, same query. So you know, you don't have to depend on somebody else's catalog. Anything with a CSW service, you could add to this list, and it would just find those data sets as well. So um, I think I'm going to skip. You know, I'm not going to go <laughs> through all the code here. I'm just going to hit the highlights. Um, and this is basically the, the key here is um, from OWSlib. So that's a package which works with CSW. And we're going to basically in, import the filter package. And then we're going to do things like we're going to say, find any a property with any text that matches any of the names. So if there's any text with any of these names, we're going to loop through and create uh, these filters. But we're not going to take anything that has GRIB2 in it. You know, We looked at the list that came back. We're like, yeah, OK, we don't want those GRIB2 entries. Um, here's the beginning and the end dates. Here's the, here's the bounding box. And here's putting it all together. So the point of this is um, you can use very complex queries here. You can use ands and ors or nots and, and string a whole bunch of complex stuff together to do your query. And you, know, that you might iterate on that a bit uh, to when you realize that there's some, you're getting some data sets you don't want or you've missed some or something like that that you do want. So down here, here are all the data sets that came back. So we discovered all these data sets. Here are their DAP endpoints. Here's the second catalog. We found one here. Um, I think, let's see, I'm going to skip down here. Found, it's just printing out let's say, what it found. Um, and down here, basically, is where we're doing the uh, heavy lifting in terms of, of plowing through all the model output using IRIS and interpolating the, uh, the discovered time series. Or we're, we're extracting a time series at the buoy locations from each model output. OK, then we store all those in uh, little, small little files locally. And then we do some skill assessment. Um, we just compute some different quantities. It doesn't really matter what they are for the purposes of this presentation. Oh, and here um, we're actually creating our map. So we're going to put all this stuff on a map. And here we've added a couple of layers that we uh, think users might find interesting, uh, a um, satellite uh, temperature image and some um, sea surface velocity. and. Uh, I think I'll just skip to the bottom here, show you the big uh, result. Oh, and there's, well, actually, here's where we're making some time series with bokeh. So, which, so, those, so both Folium. Folium is really nice for making interactive uh, maps in the browser. And Folium is really nice for making interactive sort of charting applications. Uh, well, at least that's what we're using it for here. It can do much more than that. So here, finally, is the product <laughs> that gets formed at the bottom of the notebook. Um, so you can just see that it discovered all these different uh, stations. And it has a little pop-up um, here that tells you how many different models it found at these different locations. So if we click on this little chart here, it pops up the bokeh plot. And we can see that, um, let's see here, we can't quite see because it's off the screen. Um, control minus. OK, so uh, the red line is the observations, and these are the different models. So you know what's going on here is pretty impressive, right? It, it found all these different models from all these different places, different kinds of models, different coordinate systems, extracted time series, and put them all together on the same time base so you can actually compare these things. And you can see, actually, this is the first time I had done this, actually, last night for New York Harbor, that this model is having uh, the diurnal variations are much too large. It's getting way too warm during the day compared to the observations. And this is not, well, it's surprising in a way, but it's, every time we look at these different models in different regions compared to data, we always find interesting things. I mean, it's, the modelers can only do so much when they do their sort of verification. And here they're trying to simulate the whole ocean right for all time. So there's lots of things to look at. And tools like this really help us understand how well these different models are doing. If we wanted to look at another spot, and see if that's uh, consistent. You know, we could, um, I don't know, we could look over here or something. And uh, the colors have changed, but uh, the red line is still the observations. And this model is indeed the same model um, from Sakura. 
and where Philippe works. Philippe, get to work. <laughs> um, so, uh, so basically, um, that's all I wanted to show you from that. And I'm just going to switch back to the slides here just to finish up. Um, if you want to see, uh, read a little paper about the, the Boston Light Swim, we, we've entitled it a much more sexy name, Dynamic Reasonable Workflows for Ocean Science. We could use some more citations, which is the reason I'm showing it here. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, um, and I just wanted to put in a little plug. So if you guys are not using ContaForge for your packaging, uh, you really you should be. Um, it's fantastic. It's, it's what's enabled us to to be able to let some, you know, it's one thing to share your notebook with someone, but you have to be able to share the environment so they can run the notebook. And you have to share it in case they're running Windows, in case they're running Mac or Linux. Um, and ContaForge is a way that you can just put your code up there and continuous integration will build the binary packages for Mac, Windows, and Linux and basically make them available to the community. So it's a whole bunch of automated stuff there. And, and there's, Philippe's done a ton of work on this. Um, so thank you, Philippe. Uh, Phil Elson, also from the British Met Office, has been huge, and, and many others. But there's 2,900 packages on ContaForge. And um, it's basically all you really need is, is ContaForge and the defaults channel when you're using Anaconda to install things. So in summary, the standardized framework, I think it makes the skill assessment, you know, we really that those skill assessment has never been done before on all those models and for the you know the different kinds of data because it's just too hard to do compare all those models and you know I would say it wasn't easy for us exactly right that was a pretty complicated notebook but now it's going to be easy for you because you can just grab that notebook and um, and it, and I hope you I've convinced you that it's quite powerful the services the provider services are easy to install the the client stuff is easy to install because of things like Anaconda provider services because of Docker. These skill assessment notebooks are reproducible. They're reproducible for free. <laughs> and you know, and the, and the really important thing is that these kind of tools lead to a more appropriate uses of the modeling products, right? So somebody can go and they can check out how well these models are working for their particular use case, and they can decide how best to use them. And also important is that we can get back to the modelers and tell them, hey, you know, you've got a problem with that diurnal variation. And usually, you know, they pretty quickly find out what the problem is, and we make better mo models. So we improve our models more quickly. So that's it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Rich. That was very interesting. Um, now I'd like to move on to uh, Albert Sanchez, who is going to talk about how Python is used in a web service reducing the gap between data and analysis for Earth observation scientists. Uh, particularly with respect to time series of vegetation and disease in the Amazon forest. Albert? Um, yes, here I am, uh, Chris. So um, I want to share my screen. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Albert Sanchez. On behalf of the National Institute of Space Research and Gilberto Lugia Rolf and Victor. I welcome you to this presentation on uh, a web service of time series of observation data. So I'm going to talk about the Ethensing project where we work right now, uh, one of our products, the web time series service, and what can you do to integrate uh, this service into Python. So, uh, okay, you already know Jupyter Notebooks. The code you are going to see is available on, on GitHub. You can uh, clone it, download it, uh, modify it, play with it, and find new things. Um, uh, well, the Essencing Project is all about building a platform for handling uh, big geospatial data. We are organizing decades of satellite images into arrays in order to put together data and analysis to make research easier and to boost the uh, capabilities of scientists, particularly on scientists uh, doing research on land cover, to find new things or to go uh, to cover larger extensions of uh, larger areas or to do longer analysis uh, regarding time series. So uh, basically our approach is to take the, the, the satellite images as they are and stack them together and then apply uh, analysis uh, using the array data model. So basically, the array data model allows easy access 
and it also allows parallelization. Uh, it, it fits very well in existing paradigms of computing um, for processing a, a big data. Uh, so what we are going to do is to, what we are doing is putting the images together in a database and join it together with um, algorithms of analysis and make those available to scientists. What is our approach? Well, first we are going to make available a, a time series for testing algorithms and later we are going to take those algorithms and run them in our infrastructure of big data. So how are we going to do that? First is the web time series service that is a, a lightweight JSON web service that allows access to remote imagery. Um, it, it, this service list describes and retrieves a time series of air observation data. Um, and uh, we also provide a client uh, for this service that you can use on Python applications. So uh, the examples we are running, uh, running tonight uh, is, uh, are all of them uh, make use of this Python client. So the first operation uh, the WTS provides is a list coverages. So uh, in this way, you can inspect what is inside of uh, our server. For example, here, we are creating a WTSS connection. And then we iterate through the contents. So uh, we discover that these uh, coverage are available. We are interested in this coverage. And that, uh, um, it's a, uh, it provides access to modest data. So now we are going to describe the data. That's another operation of the of the service. And here we call the describe operation on this coverage, and then we just uh, we just print the properties of this array. So we, here we can see that this is an array of vegetation indexes, and more data is available in this URI. So our time series starts in 2000 and goes up to 2017. And we have these uh, attributes available. Here we are interested in the ABI, Enhanced Vegetation Index, and NDBI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. So now the tier operation provided by WTSS is time series. This operation allows us to retrieve a time series of modest data on a single point. So we provide a latitude and longitude in WGS84 coordinate system. And then we call the time series operation, giving the coverage, the data we want to retrieve, and the latitude and longitude. Here we use Pandas. This is a scientific uh, library provided by Python to buy a series of NDVI, series of ABI, and we put them together into a data frame. Uh, into a data frame. Here you can see the first five rows of our data frame. Uh, if you are wondering where is located, uh, this point where we're studying is right here in Brazil. And we are using a volume. It's a Python wrapper for the leaflet uh, JavaScript uh, set of libraries for handling maps. So um, how, do, how can we make, uh, how can we integrate Python analysis uh, and WTSS? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is data visualization. So, for example, here, we just plot the data using the matplot library that was mentioned before tonight. And this is uh, our, that, uh, our time series of NDVI, of ABI, from 2000, uh, 2017. So, uh, now, regarding analysis, well, the first thing that comes to mind when analyzing time series is to fit a line. So we wrote a Python function. I'm going to show you here. This is our Python function. We are using a, a library. Uh, the library stats is part of NumPy on Python. And we wrap that in order to, in this function, to make easier for, for you to fit a line to the data. So we take our data frame and create a new column here, NDVI LM, and we fit a line of NDVI. And uh, this code is here for floating. Here you can see the, the, the indexes and the lines. You can see a negative trend 
And this trend is because of this deforestation event that uh, happened in 2011. If we want, we can see here um, the what we are doing here is take our time series of vegetation indexes and add two new columns, NDVI-LM and ABI-LM, and we are plotting those. So let's move forward. Uh, OK, here. Another analysis very common for time series is for the composition. So basically, the idea you you, you approximate the time series using wave functions. And these wave functions are characterized by uh, amplitude, wavelength, and frequency. It's, it's well known that fre uh, high frequencies are associated with noise. So if we remove the noise, uh, the high frequencies, we filter of time series. So that's exactly what we do in this example, again. We set up a function uh, and apply to NDBI and store that as a new column in our data frame. Here you can see the result. And we have some control of here. Uh, if you pay close attention, the more frequencies we use, the more close the, 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 the Fourier filter approximates the original time series. So if, for example, we change this value here. You can see that the smooth is the, the time series, the approximation of the Fourier is way more smooth. So uh, another filter we can use that is of particular interest for us, because it was refer, uh, referred by Atkinson before, specifically for a land, land cover application, is the Whittaker smoother. So uh, basically, Whittaker is a linear combination of nearby observations. Um, we grab that into a function here. And again, we add a new column to our Pandas data frame with the results. As Fourier, the Whittaker filter uh, takes um, one parameter, which we can use to uh, change the amount of filtering of smoothing uh, to our time series. That is very useful for removing these negative pikes that probably are related to atmospheric conditions during uh, the, when the image was taken. Um, the Kalman filter is another filter we're known in time series. It's used in basically in aeronautics. Um, uh, basically, it's, um, it's very fast. It consumes very low memory. It has a low memory footprint. And uh, it, um, it tries to approximate the true value of the momentum of the time series. That is the mean. So here you can see that the, the current filter starts low, approximates the value, but it reacts slowly to our deforestation event. That ha uh, we can use that property to, to do some, uh, some other application uh, to further explore the properties of the time series or perhaps to detect uh, deforestation. Well, uh, another kind of problem we can um, on which we can use the uh, wave time series service is for classification. Specifically, we prepare a, a small implementation of dynamic time warping. Basically, uh, this is an, a, classific a classification algorithm that compares samples to patterns and computes a distance that is the difference between the sample and the pattern. So. We prepared two patterns of so the forest and Cerrado biomes here in Brazil. And taking a lot of time series, we, uh, we, process, uh, we process a lot of time series using gener generalized additive model. And we came up with this pattern. You can see here, we are loading them from a JSON file right here. So you can see how these patterns behave um, uh, uh, during the year, the days of the year. Uh, um, on vegetation indexes. So now we have our samples. So we take uh, some samples. We go, uh, we go into the field and collect the time of cover, of land cover that sample had in a specific moment of time. And so here you can see the table. We have a latitude, longitude, a time interval, and the land cover that time series got in that moment. So again, they belong to Cerrado and to Forest. 
So now that we have latitude and longitude, we are going to use WTSS to retrieve the time series belonging to those points. You can see them here. Uh, we have five time series of Cerrado and five time series of Forest. As you can see, the time series are very noisy. And now we are going to do the classification. Basically, we compute the, w, uh, the DTW distance for, for, for each sample to each pattern. And we find the closest pattern to each sample. And these are our results. So um, we know, for example, that the first time series belongs to Cerrado. And DTW classification uh, predicts it at Cerrado, so it's a true. Uh, 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 the classification is right. I would like you to, to call your attention to number three, to our time series number three where there is a mismatch. So here, using the analysis tools of Python and WTSS, uh, we can see what happened in that point. So here you have very smooth the Cerrado pattern and a smooth pattern of forest. And here we have the noisy time series. So you can see, despite the fact that it's a uh, it's assigned the label Cerrado. It's kind of close to the to the forest pattern. So just to to close uh, our presentation, we introduce the Essencing project. We are we are handling a large data set of error observation, and we make them available for you as time series. Uh, we present the uh, the web time series service, a live web time series a service that allows you to play with our data or with our ten, uh, time series, a Python, uh, Python client for, uh, for that service, and how you can use it to integrate into our real existing uh, Python libraries for analysis, uh, and perhaps to improve um, our knowledge about uh, the change on land cover or uh, land use. So uh, I would like to add that we we are uh, working on on Python, but we are we are also working on on, on R uh, for doing for doing our, our analysis. Um, and I think that's all on our side. I would like to take you back to to Chris and Jennifer, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Albert. That was an excellent talk. Um, and I noticed even more commonalities coming out in the, in the various talks, like the use of folium for mapping, for instance. Um, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer to moderate any questions that any of the uh, attendees might have. Jennifer? Uh, yes. So if anybody has any questions, if you could type those into the Q&A pod, and you'll find that located on the right-hand corner of your screen. This works like a chat. So far, there are no questions. And then um, for those of you who may be interested in downloading the presentation files, I have uh, posted those in the file sharing pod in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you uh, select any of those files, you should be prompted with the option to download the file. Then, of course, the recording will be made available. I should have that edited uh, tomorrow. And uh, it'll be posted, I think, on the CIOS Swigis. There's a YouTube channel, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Are there any questions? OK, so Chris. Uh, Chris has a question. Albert, are you using Jupyter for your work in R as well? Oh, uh, yes, we are. Um, we, just are uh, we are just using a RISE plugin that allows uh, Jupyter Notebooks to become slides presentations. So it's, it's, Jupyter, it's a Jupyter Notebook. As I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, you can go to our GitHub repo and clone it, download it, play with it. But it is a Jupyter Notebook. OK, thank you, Albert. The next question is, did you use any REST libraries for WTSS?
Uh, yes, we the, the the WTF is implemented and is using REST uh, web services. So basically, WTSF is built uh, under the assumption of a fast access to um, time series. So we we, we use uh, JSON um, instead of XML, for example, in order to reduce the, the amount of data going to to the network. And we try to 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 minimize the the size of the headings. Since uh, WTSS is a web service, is um, it goes through the through the web as a text. Okay, great. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? All right, we'll give this a couple minutes or so. If there are no additional questions, what I'll generally do is we will log off from the audio component of this webinar, and then I'll leave the virtual meeting space open for an additional five to 10 minutes or so for those of you who may be interested in downloading the file. Um, and Jennifer, we will be posting this on the CIOS YouTube channel eventually. Is that right? Yes. I will not be posting it there, but I think um, yes. other Jan Suk or Kim, right? Yes. Um, we will install it in the CIOS YouTube channel and then uh, link the URL to that YouTube uh, uh, recording uh, on the wiggis.cios.org. Okay, great. That sounds great. I think a lot of people will actually want to see these recordings. Yes, yes. Especially the demos were very interesting and, and the, uh, the demos you can't you know, really read through the slides to get. Agreed. Well, thank you very much. Are there any additional questions? All right. Let me take a look uh, really quickly here. Um, Chris, I don't know if you have any final remarks. Um, if there are no further questions, what we'll do? Ah, yes. Okay. And may you give me a link for the YouTube channel, please? Yes, um, that will be on the wiggis.cs.org. You know, we won't have that link until after that video is installed. But I think you could probably also monitor that channel. I think there's an actual yes. CS channel. Yes. And we can get that to whoever asked. Yes. So I will so it's um, I believe I, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly um, either Julio or Julio I'm not I'm quite certain and so usually it will take you know uh, within the next day I should have that ready I'll provide a direct link and then I'll also um, provide the MP4 to Jan Suk uh, and then you should be able to access it from the URL that I entered just a few minutes ago. Here, let's see. And by the way, the previous Wigus uh, technical webinars are up there as well. Uh, so I believe we have the one on uh, data cubes, which has some overlap with uh, Syed's talk on the Open Data Cube project. Okay, Chris or Yun Suk, do you have any final remarks? If not, I think uh, we can wrap up this webinar and I will log off from the audio component and leave the virtual meeting space open an additional five minutes or so. Um, if anybody thinks of anything, feel free to enter that into the Q&A pod. Um, that content will be delivered to Chris and Yun Suk, so we can certainly follow up um, offline. Yeah, I just want to thank the speakers for three very interesting talks. It shows that I think that our community has really come a long way with respect to making analytics uh, more usable for the end science and decision support users. So thank you again. Thank you very much. I, I think this will be very, very useful to lots of people around the world, and, and we will share the, the, the um, information about the webinar recordings broadly. Okay, great. At this point, we will log off from the audio component and uh, be looking for those files uh, from Jan Suk or Chris in the next day or so. Thanks very much, everybody. 
All right.